I see it. I see it. We do apologize. Bringing you a live safari from the, the middle of the African bush sometimes comes with interesting complications. But we thank you for your patience and we're glad that you are all here. And while I try and work out where I am and how to get somewhere else. Oh, there we go. I got it. Well done, Viam. He's spot on. Let's go back to Brent and his wild dogs. Oh yeah, we're still with the dogs um, and they have started slowly getting moving and you can see they do love water and uh, in certain parts where they've got to cross rivers and stuff they always seem to choose pans, they are nervous of deep water where there could be a crocodile. So there we go. Looks like they Oh, lion! No! 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 Oh no! Hold on, hold on, hold on! That came out of nowhere! Oh no, she's after another dog! Oh no! Oh no! She's going back to kill this dog here. Have you got that, Jandre? Let me just go around. Oh no. Oh man, this was, this is, this. Guys, just be warned, this is really, really difficult to look at. This is nature and this is really hard for me. This is my favorite animal. It's one of the, the youngsters. And we were just talking about how high their mortality rates are. And the biggest threat to them is lions. Oh no, I'm shaking. Oh. The rest of the pack are still watching. Oh, this is so sad, guys. It's one of the sticks lionesses. Oh my goodness. Oh. Oh no, guys. There's that. Oh, guys, this is so, I'm sorry, I'm, this is natural. I, I do warn you, this is, you got to be very careful. This is really, really, really difficult. Oh, she's going after the dogs again. No, go dogs! Move it! Move! Okay. Oh. I don't know what to do. I don't know what to say, guys. I know this is so difficult. What I think happened is the hooded vultures um, spotted. Uh, the lion spotted the, the, the hooded vultures coming down, and that's what attracted it here. Apparently, there's a Birmingham boy on his way here as well. Um, uh, this is such a thing. That, that, that thing is that the wild dog is dead. Um, there's not much we can do. We're going to try to see what's happening with the rest of the pack. Um, let me just... Okay, so they went off there. Now, there's no real roads in this area. Um, and now, this, okay, let's just, what's happened now is the pack will have bombshelled. It might even take them 45 minutes to half an hour uh, to get back together. And you know what, it, it, this is, I'm... okay, let's take a breath. Here comes the lioness, she's coming back. And guys, I know this is going to be very difficult for, for, for a lot of you. So um, this is nature and this is live. So I cannot script what's going to happen next. The wild dog is dead. Um, she might feed on it. So uh, we're not going to chase after the pack. I mean, this, this, uh, this is really difficult for me. Wild dogs are my favorite, favorite animal. But um, this is behavior that you never really get to see. So let, we're going to stick with the lioness. She's probably going to come pick up that carcass again. She left it in the grass here. Now, it'll be interesting to see if the Birmingham boy comes back. 
now she's now this is predator on predator so look at that she, she's making making sure it's dead um, I'm gonna try to find a little gap through the grass for you Jandre now guys if you are sensitive now is not the time um, to be watching there's there's another line S coming um, Oh, she's biting the. Sorry, I'm 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 all over the place, guys. Just I'll, I'll take a second. So there's a second sticks line is coming in. I'm not sure where the male is. The stations is not two. Uh, one satengal at bobin pan. Um, she has started feeding on the carcass. Okay, so I've just heard. Sean's got them. They're, they're heading east. And they're heading far away from here. Now, she spotted the other lioness. They've spotted each other. Now, obviously, she would have heard that commotion from the dogs, that, that distress call. Now, I'm pretty sure that what happened is uh, hooded vultures and whiteback vultures will follow wild dogs. And while we're sitting watching the wild dogs at the pan, uh, a hooded vulture landed very close by and the lions came to investigate. It's going to be interesting to see what happens over the carcass. Now you can see the wild dog's tail still flicking. Don't worry, the wild dog is, is not alive. That is just its its nerves. Um, its nerves still going. Wow, guys! Oh, that that as as you know that happens in a flash. Now you understand maybe a little bit how that life and death line. Is, is 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 so close out here now she's she's not even feeding on it she's just walking away from it um, let's see what the second lioness does Jandre as she gets to the carcass so she might just attack the carcass because it's another predator was it wild dog even though it's dead she might just sniff it and leave it it's gonna be interesting to see what she does See, there we go. Exactly what I was predicting. Um, I just got to help you guys. Guys, I can hear them calling, sounding um, closer to Zebra Drive uh, on the southern, oh, sorry, the western side of the Skova. Uh, second Sticks Lioness has now uh, come to Bourbon Pan. I didn't even get a glimpse of which which youngster that was. I really hope it wasn't that one that's got that really pretty coloration. See, look at that standing by. Sorry, guys, there's lots of... I firm two one side Tengale here. Uh, playing with the carcass at the moment. This is okay. Apparently, there's a Birmingham on his way here. Um, B. Wilson would like to know. Um, if the other or would hope that the other the other wild dogs got away, uh, they did. Um, they found them again. They're heading east towards Juma, so um, they're just leaving the carcass. Now I just want to see. I just want to see. Turn around so I can see where that Birmingham boy is coming from. Now he was a bit further away, but you see that they're not feeding on the carcass. They they might feed on the carcass if they were in, incredibly hungry. So there's the carcass in the grass. Uh, on a po oh, no positive note for me in this, but I don't think that 
that dog suffered for very long. I think it was over very, very quickly. Now we can just see the lioness who actually killed her is just disappearing in the grass over there. Heading back to where she came from. Nothing can ever prepare you for, for, for things like that. And I mean, I've seen, I've seen lions do this before, but I mean, we just, we haven't had dogs around for so long and, oh, 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 third lioness coming in. So this is the third sticks lioness. Now, Joanne, He's wondering whether the lions kill the dogs because they are competitors for prey. Uh, that is it, and they're also a threat to cubs. Um, um, so there we go, the, th the third, the third lioness. And now let's see if she goes up to that carcass. She can smell it. Now I don't know where the Birmingham is. I heard he was heading in this general direction. See. Look at that instinctive grab for the throat. Making sure it's dead. I know this is really, really disturbing. So just bear in mind if, if it's too much for you, just turn your TV off, go make a cup of tea. So I'm suddenly having a bit of a, a problem with my comms there, breaking up. Look at this. So I'm sorry guys, I just very interesting to see what he does. Chase her off that wild dog carcass. Look at him, he's stalking her. Uh, and, uh, he's interested in one thing. <laughs> Where there's death, there must be life. So he completely ignored, how interesting is that? He completely ignored the wild dog carcass. Maybe he'll come have a look now. There we go, now he's investigating. Okay, okay he's ignoring it. The stations just quickly, uh, my floor heading towards Zebra Drive, Triple M.
Uh, they've just been chased by Ngala in the west and one of them was, was killed. So they are highly mobile towards Juma. So they're having a drink now. Now, of course, I'm still still sort of trying to process what happened. So I think the female that actually killed the wild dog is um, is the mother of, of of the cubs, and she's now headed back to fetch the cubs. Okay, so I don't think anything else is, is going to happen here and those dogs sound like they're going to jump across to Juma. So I think well, it might leave these lions before they break my heart anymore and go see if we can catch up with the pack. roller coaster today and okay let's leave these lines okay well we're gonna leave these lines there's other people coming in um, I've still just need a moment to draw myself towards myself and we can we can discuss what happened a little later but while we do that let's go across to uh, Jamie and see what she's up to. I'm driving around three in a row pan is what I'm up to but I, I have to say that news has kind of taken the wind out of my sails a little bit. I know it's natural and everything but it's utterly devastating and I feel I really feel for Brent and Jandre having to witness something like that because it's utterly awful to see and the loss of one wild dog is such an enormous loss when it comes to the entire species. I mean, there's only there's less than 500 of them in South Africa, give or take. So, the loss of one is, is an utterly devastating blow. And it happens, we know it happens. And we can't demonize the lions for it. It's still very, very sad. It's a pity, we were having such a jokey, laughy drive. Shame. Poor dog. But it is one of our, those things and we will pull ourselves towards ourselves. The happy news is we're going to go, as it starts to get a little bit darker, since Cheetah Plains is quiet to say the least, although I'm actually quite thankful we've had the quiet portion of the drive, we haven't had to deal with any of those sad moments. Oh, there's some kudu. Let's look at some pretty kudu. Something nice after the sadness of that sighting. Hopefully manage, uh, Brent manages to catch up with the rest of the wild dogs on Juma. I was going to say, we're going to head towards the hyena den in a bit. See whether or not Gwen can provide us with any solace. Gwen and her cubs. Here we go. Hello lovely ladies. It's always tough to see something like that. And somehow we're able to disconnect ourselves quite a bit when it comes to antelope that are being killed by predators and I suppose it's just because we simply have to and the predators have to behave in the way that they do it doesn't mean it's not sad when it happens you pretty girls gathering together enjoying the bright bright green I cannot believe how green everything is at the moment the bush is healthy life will continue Somewhere around here, I think there is a male leopard. It's a pity because those tracks that I saw earlier were quite old. Now, if it was quarantine, he's made something of a speciality out of hunting kudu, which 
I don't know, it got me thinking, because I was thinking about it before with Hosanna, um, Karula's young cub, young leopard cub, where the distinction comes in, where a leopard first learns what kind of prey it's large enough to tackle. Because even for a male leopard, a kudu is a seriously intimidating creature. They're, they're very large antelope, and they weigh more than a male leopard weighs. And I wonder where that step happens, if they sort of graduate just going from kudu calves to slightly bigger kudu calves to adult kudus if they are intimidated before they hunt something large for the first time don't know shame that one kudu's got a very watery eye the female at the back I think she potentially has poked herself and they're very good at feeding on thorns and around thorns and in thick vegetation but every now and again it goes it goes awry it could also have been an ox picker as well that came a little bit too close. Now, of course, shame she's turned her head so we can't see. Yes, you. Both of our eyes are a bit watery. Oh, in that case, it might be an infection of some kind. The fact that both of her eyes are watering like that. There you can see. It does happen. Looks a little bit like she's crying, but it's probably an infection of some kind, perhaps in her sin it could be in her sinuses. Could also, I suppose, potentially be bot fly larvae. They do often invade the sinus cavity in the, around the eyes of animals like this. So it could be that. You can see in contrast the other antelope, the other kudu's eyes are absolutely fine. All right. Let's go see, since our kudu are standing in the shade, let's go see what else we can find. Shame. This afternoon, Brent and Jandre set off in such a cheerful mood. The weather's been so peculiar that we've got a roof on and Brent and Jandre don't. On the basis that we thought at least one of us should, especially if we were going to cheat planes. Now it, of course, is blazing sunlight. And when, Brent, when I last saw Brent and Jandre driving past us, they were singing the Flintstones theme song. Because with our vehicle roof, which you can kind of see in the shadow, <laughs> our Flintstones roof um, but yes they were in a terribly good mood I doubt that they're going to be showing the same jovial nature Joshua you're absolutely right it is unfortunate but it is the way of the bush and unfortunately you can't only well, maybe you can I don't think so though you can't really only love the good sides of nature you, it, it's like loving a person and loving them for their faults and their good side and the same goes for the bush. Sometimes it's horrible and harsh and very difficult to understand <laughs> because we talk about competition and the fact that lions and leopards and, and predators will kill each other in order to reduce competition. But it's hard to see how wild dogs would really be considered competition to them. They're effective hunters, certainly. But it's all part of nature's control and balancing mechanisms. It's just very, very sad. And I'm sorry for those of you that witnessed it. I know it's not easy to watch. And it's so strange because, I mean, while we go through this dip, it's been so long since there were lions in that area. The Salalas have been backwards and forwards from there, but really, there haven't been that many predators. The sticks haven't been there. They haven't been on Arethusa all that often. They've usually been around this part of Cheetah Plains. So far east, I mean west, opposite direction to east. It's where they killed the buffalo not so long ago. It's where the cubs all came running, and I suppose those cubs have all not, okay, now I'm just getting depressing now. None of the Styx cubs made it either in the sighting I'm thinking of. Let's go find something cheerful. It's where we first saw Kachava. That's happy. I just want to check here quickly. No. 
I'm also very curious to know whether or not the Cheetah Brothers managed to make it their way back to each other. I agree, Stuart. I think we need some Ellie's to raise our spirits. There's nothing like an elephant sighting to make you feel better. And I found that in all... any mood that I'm in. Elephants have a way of sort of leveling everything out and just making... just bringing a little bit of perspective back. That's what we need. You're right, Stuart. There's elephant tracks everywhere, so I promise you, I promise you, if I see an elephant, I will stop for it and we can have a... have some time spent with them. I'm quite looking forward to spending a little bit of time at a hyena den as well. We'll go back and see whether we have any more luck getting those cubs used to our vehicles. And there are people who are really utterly terrified of elephants. They can't, they, they just cannot stomach being near them. But apart from the people that are terrified of elephants, I've never met a single person who's come away from an elephant sighting in a bad mood or angry or upset. They've got this amazing way of taking away a little bit. Maybe it's just the distraction of them. Let's find you something pretty to look at. Has it stopped? No. I'm trying to show you a European roller, but it kept flying. Come on, Viem. We need something cheerful. Cheerful and exciting. I also find leopards cheerful. A surprise leopard would certainly do wonders. I'm trying. I'm trying to find a leopard. It's a beetle. It's going to be about as close as we get. Now where's it gone? There was a beetle. There it is. You see it there on the corner of the, on the side of the road. Here we go, a little ground beetle. Predatory d ground beetle. <laughs> Not quite what I was going for. It has yellow stripes and two yellow spots. Doesn't quite count though, does it? And it's dashed away. Note to self, bad time to drive west. Right, I'm going to search for some cheerful things to try and cheer you all up. And while I do that, perhaps Steph has something to offer you all. I hope I have something to offer you other than I was just going to have a discussion on how I feel about that wild dog and lion interaction, you know? Um, and... Phew, isn't it just amazing how things in a blink of an eye can change just like that? I mean, it's just incredible. Nothing to, no laughing matter, not a funny matter at all, but it does definitely happen out here. I personally have seen uh, leopard catch wild dog. I've never seen lion uh, bump into wild dog like that and, and tackle one, but it's not unheard of, definitely. And I'm sure Brent has regaled you with many stories in his experiences as to what is called wild dog like that, but shame, they do, they, do, they do seem to have very little in terms of defenses. Them and cheetah share that similarity in that uh, they're both so superb at hunting and at filling the niche that they, that they occupy, but they have very little uh, to offer in defense to the more advanced cats, things like leopard and lion, for instance. Um, absolutely dominate them when it comes down to a one-on-one -on -one sort of battle and just Shocking, I suppose. Uh, is it unexpected? No. Is it one of those things that is sort of uh, unfortunately not hastening the demise of the wild dogs but just increasing the pressure that they're already feeling is this inability for them to adapt to the foster evolving lion and leopard it seems. Um, but out here I think all African predators in some way or another are under 
<clears throat> a similar type of threat. Obviously with only 300 wild dog in the Kruger National Park, losing even just one like you've just witnessed now is a significant damage but at a species level, at a, at a, at a global level, losing this wild dog today is a major impact uh, on, on wild dog species. Um, <clears throat> but in the, same, in the same breath, lion for instance, there are less than a thousand lions, somewhere between a thousand and a thousand five hundred lions in the Kruger National Park, less than twenty thousand lions left in Africa and I mean, lion numbers have plummeted in the last 20, 30 years as well to a, a, a point where you don't find lion outside of very well protected wilderness areas like this and even there they're getting hammered. Leopard on the other hand, they occur um, quite f frequently outside of the boundaries of, of national parks and quite frequently outside of the, 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 the conservation areas but even they are being targeted for their skins and for their skeletons and for their body parts like their nails and their teeth and claws and I mean just at a, at a level that's just not, not sustainable and then of course we have cheetah where there's also only about 300 cheetah in the Kruger National Park, also only about 1,500 to 2,500 cats in Africa, in southern Africa at least and, um, and they once again, they're they feeling environmental pressure, they also can't adapt to the competition, they can't adapt to leopard and lion. However, I think on a um, on a, on, a, on a more cheerful note than, than that um, is the fact that I think that cheetah probably have one of the best chances of surviving now than they ever had. There's massive amounts of, of conservation energy and effort going into cheetah conservation and because they're actually so successful outside of the wilderness areas where lion do not occur anymore, the numbers outside of the parks have started to rise, funnily enough. So though they're still they're still critically endangered because just the volume of che cheetah are not there anymore. Um, they don't seem to be suffering from the same malady that the, wi that the wild dogs do and that in that wild dogs are very susceptible to canine distemper and rabies and diseases that domesticated dogs can pass on to them and do frequently pass on to them um, to the detriment of entire packs sometimes. Um, I mean two years ago the pack that lives on um, on Blue Canyon, which is a reserve where Brent's parents have a house, the entire pack uh, died as a result of canine distemper. Um, now there's I think three or four dogs that have been reintroduced there again, but still just shocking at how quickly things can change. And even a pack as healthy as what we were witnessing uh, can lose one of their members as quickly as what they did. Makes me worry about walking around out there. I don't quite know what you're going to bump into next. Just trying to have a look at what this is. I think it's a marula seed. But um, I'm not actually quite sure. Have a look at this. I think this is a marula seed that has gone through the gut of an impala. And the gastric juices have done their work but also have managed to flatten out what is usually quite fuzzy so if you had to ferment or you know scrape away at a marula nut you'll find that the fruit sticks to the seed with this type of fuzz and the only way that we're going to find out is by hauling out this tool and by polishing away there we go so there I've just confirmed this is a marula nut I was beginning to doubt my sanity there for a bit you can see that that brown casing there that brown woody casing that is the actual nut and inside there is the seed. So we're able to get the window, that mythical aperture that uh, you can open that I haven't managed yet to do for you uh, live on screen. I normally have to resort to bashing it open with a stick but I can show you, ah that's actually a very good way of showing you this aperture. So there you go, there you can see that mythical place that you can now access the seed from. And how you do it is you have to find the hinge. So what you do is you just undo the hinge there. And I'm hoping I can do this in the next three or four seconds. I don't want to keep you here too long. So I'm hoping to just dig out this hinge here. 
and I'm only going to give it one bash here and then I'll carry on doing it off air for you. No, not going to work this time, you know, it's one of these things, one day I'll get it right, eh? Um, ah, there we go, got it. <laughs> okay. And there's the seed on the inside. Now this has passed through an Impala's nether regions, but there you can dig out the seed like that and then pop it into your mouth. Very almondy. I quite enjoy these. Mm. All right, and I think on that fantastic note, and I feel quite elated that I finally got it right for you on one of these uh, <laughs> one of these bushwalks. I'm going to send you over to Brent. He's going to give you an update on what he's been up to. Okay, so we're trying to catch up with the pack again. They've crossed into Juma. Obviously, of course, they were really maneuvering, so we're not sure exactly where they are. So we're busy doing these big loops. Now, we've had a bit of time to process what just happened. And it is, and it was incredibly sad, but I got a chance to think about it afterwards. And uh, you probably find the reason that female was so intent on actually getting one of those dogs is it's the mother of those two sticks cubs um, and after we left uh, those cubs arrived actually so just as we were leaving the cubs arrived but uh, there was another vehicle coming in so we, we had to move um, does that look like dog tracks outside there Jandre? not sure but no, and uh, I think the dogs just got caught napping, and even with those massive ears, those incre that incredible, sorry, that incredible hearing, they still weren't able to hear that stealthy approach of that lioness. Orbs, uh, they came straight towards that big um, uh, oh, brown ivory tree uh, at the top end of Philemon's Dip is what the guys from the um, west were telling me. I, I wasn't there when they crossed. Okay, so we're going to do a, another big loop down towards Twin Dams. And I think I think there's a good chance these dogs are going to be, they could even be off Juma already. They're putting as much distance between themselves and the lions as possible. Uh, lions are literally the, the biggest natural wild nemesis uh, outside of disease and, and uh, two, two wild dogs and as difficult as, as that was to watch it was an extreme privilege to be able to, to to see nature taking place right in front of our eyes I mean unedited um, is very sad though <laughs> Uh, now, Jane would like to know whether the pack would have acted differently if it was an alpha. Uh, I don't think so. I think they would have reacted exactly the same. Uh, you see, they came back and they... jean has got some tracks. Let me just have a quick look at them. Uh, they did that alarming until she actually took off after them again. So, hyena. Um... I'm not sure where they're gone. I think they might even be through Juma already. I think we, we're really sort of hoping that they're not hoping we can find them again. Uh, I'm going to do another loop, twin dams, and then back towards the Buffalo boundary. I'm literally cutting across the whole of Juma trying to find tracks at the moment because uh, they, are, they were so highly mobile when they crossed, and understandably so. And back to Jan's question there about alpha being killed. An alpha being killed is a much bigger problem. It sometimes causes the pack to, 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 to dissolve. Uh, in other cases, one of the beta individuals will immediately step into that role. Uh, but it, it, is, it is a far, a far bigger effect on the, on, the, on the pack if it is an alpha that is killed. Uh, that was insane. Now, Lionheart is wondering why the dogs didn't hear or smell uh, the, 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 the lion coming. I'll, I'm going to answer in a second. Standing by. Uh, I affirm, uh, just briefly, and I went through to Treehouse. Uh, still no sign of the tracks. The last tracks I had were uh, on Zoe's at the Big Brown Ivory Tree. 
sorry, everyone's trying to find the dogs now. We're all looping around the area. Hey, Firm. Um, so, the reason, uh, the reason that, that they weren't seen, sorry, uh, not, not that I know of, Lex. Okay. Um, so the reason they didn't hear it, that they were they were starting to get moving, so they were quite relaxed. They were, some of them were splashing around in the water, uh, and 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 a lion is a supreme predator. They are designed to be stalk and ambush predators, and um, and they just I think the dogs were more sort of waking up and, and getting ready to go out on the hunt, so they weren't weren't paying as much attention. Okay, so I just want to stop and listen for a second. Now, of course, one of the best ways to to find wild dogs is, especially in a situation like this, if, if there is maybe one or two dogs that were separated from the rest of the pack, um, and they do the contact calling. But I haven't heard that since that initial action happened. So we can't hear anything, and uh, let's go back to Steph, who's enjoying a marula meal. I have been actually. I haven't actually moved far at all. I'd like to tell you that it's because I'm trying to listen for the wild dog contact call, the same as Brent, but it's not. It's because I wanted to dig out the other seed inside this marula pip, and it took me a bit of time. And uh, I wanted to eat it, which I now have done, and now I can move on. So I'm feeling quite comfortable. I am going to give this to Craig, who I hope will shine this up with his finger. Quite often these marula nuts, if you just rub them for, for a long time, it takes a couple of weeks. Get, they get such a nice shine to the wood. And then you can drill a hole through there and you can put it around your neck. Craig comes from Durban and he's a bit of a surfer boy. So I imagine a wooden ambulance around his neck is going to be one of those things that he really wants to do. But come and have a look a bit closer here because I think suspicion that it's been killed because inside there is a spider that caught it. So those two white blobs that are underneath my index finger now, those are the seed or the, the, the uh, egg capsules of a spider that's living there. And you can actually see the leg, the foreleg of the spider sticking out on the bottom capsule and what's happened is this spider's built her home underneath this piece of lichen this assassin bug which is that insect there ah oh, there she comes the assassin bug was just one of her victims and when we brushed off this piece of lichen what looked like a spider initially was actually just her dinner quite awesome eh? so what we're going to do is put her back Excuse me, sniffing like this, my terminalia um, medicine that I had for for controlling the um, flu symptoms that I'm having at the moment has run out, and there's no terminalia where I'm standing at the moment, so I'm got a bit of I'm leaking. <laughs> as, as horrible as what that sounds. <laughs> All right, let's see what else we can find that's of interest for us here today. What is of interest is the fact that this afternoon has just, barring the incident with the wild dog and the lion, and I'm not trying to downplay that at all, I'm actually just trying to find some light at the end of the tunnel over here for everyone that's so distressed still about the whole thing, is the fact that this afternoon has been a very, very awesome from a landscape point of view. Jason? I've just got a question through for me. Is there a plant species that, and I just missed the last little bit of this, I'm just going to ask Kirsten to re repeat that so that I can get this right. So is there a plant species that was at risk because of the drought? That's actually a good question there, uh, Jason. Good question. Um, uh, let me think. No? Is my, is my answer to that. Mainly because although we've been in a dry cycle and it's taken probably the better part of five or six years to get into this dry cycle, it's still not long enough to completely drain the water table. So from, 
a surface water point of view, this drought was catastrophic and it, it really hurt a lot of trees that didn't fruit, that didn't flower, that didn't get a, a adequate leaf cover. A lot of the grass cover just disappeared. We saw almost all the insects here uh, take a massive knock. I would say there's, there wasn't one insect barring the fly uh, and flies themselves that benefited from this particular drought. And then of course all the larger animals. We saw buffalo and warthog in particular uh, uh, really get hammered by the drought but trees wise let me think no I can't think of anything I want to tell you a story about leadwood because I think it's important that that I, I say that drought can affect and does affect trees negatively um, if you drive through the Kruger National Park, especially in the south part of the park, you'll find a lot of dead leadwoods. And not too far away from here, they start in a band in that direction, south of where we are now, probably about 40 kilometers, about 30, 25, 30 miles or so from here. And all the way down the 200 miles it is to the other side of the Kruger National Park. And you'll find these leadwoods and they all look like they died at pretty much the same time because they're all in the same state of, uh, decay uh, you know fungus and lightning and fires and whatever all have a similar effect on them except that they're all different ages they're not all the same age and i had the pleasure of driving around a scientist from the kruger national park a couple of years ago and i asked him the question have you ever found out what's killed all these leadwoods and he said to me yes interestingly so that they carbon dated a, a huge sample of these leadwoods and found out that they did all die at around about the same time and they died because of a drought but that this drought was 600 years ago can you imagine that and that these trees have been standing in the Kruger National Park for 600 years some of them big some of them small and all the other leadwoods that we're seeing around at the moment are either younger than that or were leadwoods that were in a place that could weather the the drought in other words had access to adequate water enough to get them through this particular drought and it just sort of hit home that if something like a leadwood which can grow for a thousand years or a thousand five hundred years can be affected to the point where it dies because of the drought this drought that we experienced now uh, and last year, and f seemingly are still in it because we haven't had a really good rainfall here at Juma this year. Um, is it bad? You know, on a on a expanded timeline, like a thousand years or two thousand years, are we? You know, I just I just sometimes think that it's not quite as bad as all we make it out to be. Um, even though it was catastrophic from a point of view. I mean, the lions started dying because of malnutrition, basically. The buffalo were just dying every day here for about a month. Uh, water completely disappeared over here for a couple of months uh, um, in total. So it's, it's difficult for me to say. But anyway, I think, James, what I want to do in conclusion there, and to sort of without me rambling on anymore, um, did I see any trees negatively affected by the drought? No, not this particular drought. Does drought affect trees? Yes, even trees that are as long-lived as leadwood. So drought can have a catastrophic effect on trees. So it's a bit of a, I suppose, a f an answer sitting on a fence there, but yes and a bit, a bit no. Um, but I hope it gives you a clearer understanding of, uh, of you know, how drought affects trees out here. But on that note, and before I really waffle myself into you know, uh, a corner, I suppose, uh, why don't we go and have a look at Jamie, who's on her way to that hyena den, which I'm so, I'm so amped to find out where it is, actually. So before Steph waffles himself into a corner, is that what he said? <laughs> um, he sent you back across to us and we are just about to get to the hyena den, so your timing is perfect. Let's see whether or not Gwen is home. Well, there are fresh hyena tracks going towards Chitwa Dam, which means she might have left the little ones just for some peace and quiet. But let's go and see whether or not she's around. It's duck down here and I'm going in really nice and slowly just to make sure we don't scare the cubs if she isn't home. Now already I think Brent spent a little bit of time with them with her this morning and hopefully they're learning and they should learn quickly because hyenas do learn quickly hopefully they'll learn quickly that we are not in any way dangerous to them Mm 
can just keep a nice slow approach. I'm trying to see if we should stop here. Looks okay. Let's see if anybody's home. She might also just have gone for a drink and then has come back without leaving them for too long. This time is usually the perfect time to come and visit a hyena den. Sorry, I'm keep just keeping a close eye on what's going on. This is a perfect time to come and visit a hyena den because this is very often where the females return to their cubs, spend a little bit of time with them, spend a little bit of time at the den. And, oh, it was, sorry, it was yesterday, actually. It was yesterday that Brent was with them, around this time. Okay, all is quiet. No little shapes racing out. Well, I think it's safe to say that Gwen is not home, gauging, judging by the very empty burrow site. And no sign of little cubs either. Let's just sit quietly. Let's give it a few minutes and just see whether or not they decide to come out and investigate. That's what I'm hoping for. The more time we spend here, the more they realize that we're not going to be a threat to them in any way. Our laughing spotted hyena, also known as laughing hyena, because of that amazing cackling sound that they make. Ryan, you wanted to know why it is that they laugh. It's communication. So it's not a laugh. They're not laughing. They're not finding something amusing. You'll often find that they make that cackling sound when they're very, very excited or when they're, being, when they're nervous and submissive. So there's different types. They've got a whole wide range of vocalizations. And obviously, while I'm sitting here, potentially with young cubs in the den, let's go over to Brent and see what he's got. Okay, guys, it sounds like the wild dogs are back and they caught something. Um, they're about to appear down on the dam cam. I just heard from Aubrey they caught something next to Yuri's house. Watch out, Ariel. Sorry, Jandre. So they're right in the heart of our camp. There's everything going around. There's Nyala running, there's dwarf mongoose running. I couldn't hear from Robbery whether they actually caught one or they were chasing one. Now I know there's impala and baboons and all sorts down at the dam. Oh, they're chasing them right. I see the impala all pronking. Watch, there's a dog running straight to the impala. Johnny, stop, stop there. Go to the right. Oh, there we go. The other impala's about. Oh, there's the dogs. Just on the other side of Aubrey. Look at this. So even though they've lost a pack member, they are on the hunt. There's a dog, there's a dog. Oh, well spotted John Day. Sorry, I'm gonna try and get him. Oh, sorry about that. Brent seems to have vanished off your screen. As you can imagine, a wild dog chase and hunt always carries with it the certain risk that it might take us into areas that do have bad signal. Bring you a live safari, it comes with the odd, difficult moment. So we've been sitting patiently whilst Brent's been doing most of your live safari this afternoon at the seemingly empty burrow but you'll be very happy to know that Brent is still with those dogs and he's got signal. Let's go back to him. Okay, it sounds like they might have caught something or they have... No, it's just the pups. There we go. There we go. Now there's still Impala all over the place around here. Oh, wasn't that exciting? I mean, it, the positive is, I mean, we've just seen one of them die, uh, but now they're still out and they're still after uh, Impala. Life goes on out in the African bush. There's no time to uh, to sort of sit and, and, and moan and suffer. You've got to keep, keep going, keep living. Now that looks like the pups. 
there were adults dancing all around here. I keep looking up that way. We did see it. I keep looking sort of to the west. I just heard John Ray let out of a, a big deep sigh. And that's what it is with wild dogs. It is it is a roller coaster ride. One, two, three, four, five, six, at least six. I'm sure they all. Oh, now there's an adult coming in. Now you want to see if there's blood on the face. That's the the key. So we got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. At least nine. How's it, Lex? Oh, good. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So I can still only count nine. So that means some of the adults are away. There's the alpha female with that very distinct white patch on her shoulder. Now we're all, oh this, no, is that 10? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, no, still 9. Yeah. Now, so that means there's, there's still three adults missing, so we've got the alpha female. And at least one other adult. And as, as, as we've just been saying, life goes on. I mean, they literally just lost a member of a pack less than, I don't even know, an hour ago uh, to lions. But here they are, just below Inga's house, um, just below the house that I live in, um, out chasing Impala and terrorizing Inyala. And it is incredible that life does go on. And we got asked a question earlier today about whether they mourn. And here you can see, I mean, they're straight back to hunting. They've put considerable distance between themselves and the lions. Oh, here we go. That's number 10, I think. One, two. So that means there's two missing. No, three missing. Well, Ohai Bacon would like to know, what's the biggest animal uh, wild dogs will kill? Um, I've seen them kill. Oh, sorry, my thing's been caught. I've seen them kill uh, an adult kudu bull before, but a big pack, um, wildebeest, and there is a pack in Botswana that's famous for hunting buffalo out of a herd, but baby and sub-adult buffalo, so probably a sub-adult buffalo is the heaviest thing I've heard of a wild dog taking. And there's never actually been a recorded case of a, a human attack. Uh, they can be quite inquisitive with humans and come up to you and uh, especially when you're on foot you would have seen that incredible uh, sighting James had on foot with with Andrew um, with the wild dogs coming up to them but uh, I'd say biggest thing I've heard of them taking is a is a sub adult buffalo or an, an adult wildebeest now they are waiting and listening for the rest of the pack members uh, they could come in from any angle, and what we, we are really hoping to see is, is blood on the face of one of the returning ones. And you probably find what will happen is as it runs in, it'll regurgitate, and uh, then if it has made a kill, then lead the other dogs back to the kill. Okay, 
So while we wait to see if uh, the dogs return, let us go to Jamie with another one of, oh, the possibility of another apex predator. The possibility, but unfortunately I think a possibility that's not going to come to fruition this afternoon. So we've been sitting quietly just waiting and watching just to see whether or not any one of the hyena cubs pops its nose out. But it seems as though without mom here, they're going to remain well and truly hidden. So we're probably going to leave them be. Um, I'll double check around the corner just to see that Gwen isn't on her way back. And I think she's probably only going to arrive after dark. So we'll leave our hyena cubs, or at least our hyena den for now, and try again in the morning. Let the engine run for a little bit, just so that the cubs that are inside the den don't startle too much. They haven't come running out, most definitely have not. So they're still in there. Ah, very good point. I was right in the middle of answering Ryan's question about why spotted hyena laugh and then we got distracted by Brent and his wild dogs again. Uh, Ryan, we were talking about why hyenas laugh and we spoke about the fact that they have a wide range of various communication calls. One is a whooping contact and territorial call. The other is that giggling sound that they make. And as I said, a lot of that is, you'll see it especially around the den and hopefully once we get our I'm still convinced our hyenas are back, but nobody believes me. Brent disagrees. He doesn't think they're back at all. He thinks it's just Gwen. But once we have proper hyena interaction again, you'll be able to see while the cubs are around the den, the females, whenever a hyena comes in that is either a male or a submissive female, they often giggle nervously. It's, it's giggling, but it's not actually giggling, but it sounds like they're giggling. They giggle nervously when a higher ranking hyena approaches them and it's submissive. And then when you get them feeding around a carcass or potentially mobbing things like lions or wild dogs, they will yip and giggle again, also in excitement. So it's an, a way of expressing their emotion more than anything else. That's why a spotted hyena laugh. It is a very eerie sound if you're not used to it. It does sound a bit like they're cackling away or laughing. And of course, because it's associated with feeding and because it's such an eerie sound, it's one of those things that's really contributed to their somewhat unpleasant reputation, which is so unfortunate because they're incredible animals and they're unbelievably smart. And for our new viewers that have perhaps missed out on those that real hyena interaction, that's something I'm, one of the reasons why I'm so keen to find a, the other den site, if there is another den site as well in the hope that perhaps we can see some of that interaction again and you'll get to know and love them in the way that we do. Just because they are such special creatures. Shall we stop and look at the sunset for a bit and see if there's a view here? It's a bit of a view. It's not the best view I've ever picked. No, it's terrible. Well, it's okay. It'll do. There's a nice silver lining for us all. There we go. It's actually more of a pink lining, or rose gold. Right. Enough of sunset. There are animals to be found. Let's go, since there's no hyenas, let's go and see whether or not that crocodile at Twin Dams is still around. So while I do that, I'm going to send you over to Steph, who was on the open area of quarantine. Let's see what he's up to. We are actually on the open area of quarantine. This is the quarantine clearing that you see in front of us here. And uh, I've come here because it's uh, getting a little bit dark and I don't want to be caught in this thick bush, this thick summer bush, without having... Um, a, a, a distance to see basically so I've come out onto a clearing close to the camp because it is the only place where our visibility has gone from literally 20 paces in front of us to you know over a hundred which is much safer this time but sneakily I've also come here because I wouldn't mind seeing those wild dog on foot to be quite honest with you it's quite exciting seeing wild dog on foot so we are right onto the southern part of uh, of quarantine clearings and I'm hoping, holding thumbs, that, uh, that uh, those dogs decide to make an appearance on the clearings themselves. 
What has been quite interesting over the last sort of 20, 20 minutes or so that you've been away from us is we've been walking up from the Philemon's dip side, which is even further south and on the bottom of the hill. And the whole way, before we even knew there were wild dogs here, impala were just running at us. We had the big herd of impala that lives on these clearings streaming past us, and we were just wondering why. And it was at the moment we said, but these wild dogs are in the area. That, uh, that it was called in on the radio and we found out that uh, Brent was with those wild dog and you watched them do what they're doing. But isn't it just incredible that they have this massive effect on everything around us? The question that I was asking um, to, to Craig and to Rexon, who are the other two members of this walking crew that we have, is this. Will the Impala be able to go back to quarantine tonight? And if so, how? how? How will this very fragmented herd come back together? And we've decided on two possible answers. One is they know exactly where they are. So even though they've been panicked and bombshelled away from these wild dogs, that they actually know exactly where they are, similar to how I would know exactly where I am if you know, I had to run for my life from something over here. Secondly is that they have this innate ability to go up and up is where you have your clearings um, in this part of the Sabi Sands on the crests. So even though this is, an, this is a clearing we call quarantine on almost all of the crests over here it will be more open than down in the valleys and that these impala will naturally just walk uphill tonight and eventually uh, congregate again on these open areas and therefore stay safe because I can't imagine having this fragmented herd uh, is anything but unsafe for these particular uh, impala. I think they're going to need to come onto these clearings as quickly as possible uh, before they start getting picked off by other things like leopard and lion reacting to this noise that's around here. But um, So that's on impala and what they've been doing. But come and have a look over here. This is something that we've been seeing the whole of this particular dry season is this unending, ceaseless work and toil from the harvested termites. What they're doing over here is they are stockpiling harvested bits and pieces of grass and plant material. So you have a lot of workers that are busy cutting off the stems and here you can see the activities. This is the harvested ends of grass being cut off there, being cut off there, being cut off over there. And if you just spend some time looking around here you'll see that it's just Everything is just being harvested by them. They then bring it to the entrance of their burrow and they will they will stockpile it here and then what they'll do is other workers will drag this into the nest. Isn't that cool? So you find these piles of chopped up stick and branches here underneath all this place. And we've been finding the whole walk today. This whole place is just covered in termites. Awesome. Right, now I do have it on good authority that Jamie is with a crocodile. Can you believe the diversity of this particular safari today? It's incredible. I was with a crocodile. I'm still with a crocodile. And the incredible calm and peaceful waters of Twin Dams, the water hole that we're staring at, is a gentle warning and reminder to all of us to never take a water hole in Africa for granted. And presumably not just in Africa, because those of you who are in the Americas will have experienced alligators. So you'll know a little bit about the, the reptilian dangers of these very large carnivores. So a few seconds ago, the carnivore was on the the carnivore, the crocodile, <laughs> the carnivorous crocodile was on the bank. It immediately, as soon as we came around the corner, slid into the water, and there he is there he is. There we go. Hello. He slid into the water with barely a ripple and then sank to the bottom and went underneath the surface of the water. Now we can see it clearly, although it barely looks like anything other than a patch of mud when viewed from afar. Much clearer with the camera. But you could easily be fooled because crocodile, if they sink down to the bottom and slow their metabolism, they can actually potentially stay underwater for up to an hour. So you can never predict where you once didn't see crocodiles, you might all of a sudden be seeing crocodiles. It pays not to go swimming in water holes in summer when you can't see them, when you can't see down to the bottom, when you don't know how shallow or how deep the water is, you definitely don't want to run the risk. Now this crocodile's large enough to do you some damage. I don't think it would kill an adult. I don't think it's quite big enough, but kids swimming in water like this or playing on the water's edge 
And we always talk about the fact that hippo caught, kill more people than any other animal in Africa, apart, of course, from the mosquito that spreads malaria. I wonder whether that number is not actually outmatched by crocodiles. The problem is, of course, that whilst hippos leave their victims where they are, crocodile will pull them in underneath the water and then drown them, and they may never be found. So I suspect that the statistics with crocodile deaths in Africa is probably higher than hippopotamus. It's the same, it's exactly the same logic. Human beings build their settlements near water. A lot of communities in Africa don't have provided tap water or anything like that. They have to go down to the rivers to fill up water supplies, to wash their clothes. The kids go down and play on the edge. And that's where the real danger lies. They're quite sinister when they lurk like that. Now, Steph, you want to know how far Chitwa Dam is from Twin Dams? About... Let me try and work this out. It's not there. I must keep. I keep forgetting about Little Gauri. Probably about two and a half kilometers. No, in a straight line, maybe a little bit. Yeah, let's say two and a half kilometers. So it's over a mile away. It's quite a considerable distance. And this crocodile. We don't know if this crocodile came from Chitwa Dam or if it came from elsewhere. I suspect it came from Chitwa Dam, just because there's nowhere else further to the north of us that has crocodiles, unless you go right into Buffalo's Hook. But they can. They can walk very, very far when they want to. They can walk miles and miles. He just gave us a view of its back. But now it's disappeared again. Bubble, 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 bubble. And I think it's probably not going to stay here, unfortunately, because I don't think it's going to find much in the way of food. Maybe baby impala, I suppose, potentially. It's big enough to catch a baby impala or a steenbok or a daker. Definitely not a large impala or a waterbuck. And there you go gone again. Completely vanished. Not a sign that there was ever a crocodile here. It's a bit sinister in its own way. You definitely don't want to take crocodiles for granted. Uh, all I could think of is Scott standing knee-deep in twin dams trying to catch catfish, although it was much shallower then. That was ages ago. Okay. All right, crocodile. We shall leave you be, since apparently it's playing quite shy, and it has vanished almost completely. I was hoping that it might come out onto the bank. It's fascinating, though. I wonder if it did come from Chitwa Dam. I would guess so. I don't know how many big dams there are in Little Gauri, though. So it could have come from Little Gauri, just directly to the south of us. There's a few very large pans there that it might have spent some time in first before it got here. But I don't think it's going to be particularly obliging. I think it's going to stay hidden. Uh, as it starts to get a little bit dark, of course, our bushwalk team will have to start heading home. So let's head to Steph so that he can say his farewells. It is getting a little bit dark now for us to be out, but not too much. Not before I share something quite interesting with you. That is where the sun went down just a few minutes ago, and that is directly west and looking through the trees on quarantine clearing. I'm standing right where there used to be an old homestead. This has been an area where people have been living possibly on and off seasonally for a couple of hundred years, maybe even a couple of thousand years. And coming up here and standing on this mound of sand where, where we are at the moment, always gives me this sense, uh, I don't know what it is, it's, it's, it's how many sunsets have people watched from this place, looking in exactly that direction. What have they seen through the coming of the ages? What, the land hasn't changed. You probably find it looked exactly like this, you know, 2,000 years ago. Um, you know, so while the land hasn't changed, the people on the land, the way that that land has, has been used, what they've seen flying around in the skies, what they've heard about has just changed. I don't know, I only think about that when I, uh, when I come onto these, uh, these, this particular spot actually on quarantine. Quite nice, actually. Anyway, while I say goodbye, I think it's a good idea for me to stop that train of thought and that waffling that I get into. I'm going to say goodbye from this, uh, this afternoon's or the, the sunset safari's bushwalk, and I uh, will catch you tomorrow morning for another bushwalk again. Uh, but in the meantime, don't go anywhere because uh, Brent and Jamie are still out there. So we'll see you later.
Well, we've lost the dogs. They've disappeared into this thicket in the... I thought I heard something. In the... in the... in the... Milwati, I think we're gonna call it a night for the dogs. I'm gonna leave the area. It has been an absolute roller coaster today. Oh but that is one of the things about being live out here. There's no there's no censoring, there, there there's no editing. What happens happens. And you've just gotta try deal with what happens as best as you can. And I mean it's and, and, and even for even for me, and, and I mean, I've seen lions kill wild dogs probably seven or eight times. It's probably my, maybe even my tenth time. It still gets me every single time. Um, it is just really tough to watch, especially with an animal that I, I love so much and love spending time with, and I actually haven't spent nearly as much time with over the last little while as I I would have liked to to see that. But then I've just got to step back and. And realize how incredibly lucky I am to witness something like that. Uh, to witness wildlife interacting as they have done on the savannah for hundreds of thousands of years. That is a, that is a battle uh, and, a, and a challenge that's been going on year after year, uh, <laughs> ah, millennia after millennia uh, between the different predators. And, and we've just got to remember we're so privileged that, that we are there live uh, and even the difficult stuff, um, once you've got a, a bit of time to reflect, uh, is is it's not nice to watch, but it, it is, it's still special to watch, if that makes any sense. Oh dear. I'm, I'm hoping they're going to be around in the morning. Hi, uh, Thomas in Pennsylvania. Uh, Thomas is wondering, did I see the lioness before the attack? I actually can't remember. I think just before. Um, John Dray, can you remember? Just saw the dog's heads up. Just saw the dog's heads up. I, I do remember seeing her charge in from about 20 meters away. So I think I saw saw her. I I, I mean, it, it, I do feel like it's a bit of P, a PTSD after that. Don't really know what's going on, and um, I don't really want to because. But I'm, I'm definitely going to go have a look at the the footage afterwards to try sort of piece together what happened. Um, Oh, it was so, it was so, so hard to watch. I'm mean, almost thankful that that, that Timbuti tree was in the way, that, that we didn't see the, the everything, but to hear those dogs' bones crunch. And, and, and again, if we, if, if, we, if we separate ourselves a little bit, uh, that, that, that incredibly interesting behavior we saw afterwards, you saw the, how the other lionesses who weren't there, they get in there and they grip and they shake that dog like it's still alive. Uh, I've seen them do it to, to leopards as well and to hyenas when they've killed them. So it, it, it is, it's that predatory instinct to take out any possible competition. And I think that lioness was far more uh, set on making sure those dogs weren't around or getting one of those dogs because uh, of her cubs being so close by. So those cubs were no more than about 150 meters away from where those dogs were lying. And uh, if the lions had headed out hunting and uh, come back, uh, and the dogs had headed out hunting after the lions and or stumbled upon those cubs, they, they would have killed them. And so it's the lioness protecting her offspring as well. We've got to remember that. The first time we were there afterwards, nasty sticks lions. I don't like the sticks lions anymore. Hi, a Sally. Uh, Sally is wondering now that that if the lions leave that kill there and they don't eat it. Well, see, the cubs might eat it. I'm not sure. Um, would someone retrieve that carcass for study? Uh, yes, they would. Unfortunately, what happens in the a lot of the time, um, you've got to give it a day. So move off etc so by the time you get there by the time you get there tomorrow hyenas might have munched it all and th th there's nothing left um, so you never know but I'm, I will get hold of uh, the my friend Grant who works for the endangered wildlife trust on the wild dogs and um, and and see if, even if we can just get a maybe a hair sample from from that area tomorrow Oh, there 
there's the lucky scrub hair. I don't know if you just saw it shoot across the road. It's the same scrub hair that nearly died uh, a, a little while ago. Um, while we were doing a Facebook Live, the dogs chased the scrub hair and it went into a, a road pipe there, that road pipe right here. That scrub hair managed to get underground. The dogs look quite confused uh, as to why. There we go, there's the pipe coming up. That scrub hair got right into that tiny pipe uh, next to the road there um, and escaped the wild dogs. Oops, sorry, drawn that. There we go. Okay, well, I'm in a sort of bumble now. I'm not, not focusing on anything. I'm just sort of reflecting on what's happened this afternoon. And uh, while we do that, uh, let's go see what Jamie's up to. I'm doing much the same as Brent. Um, obviously, having not witnessed it, but having heard about what happened, I think it's a rather subdued Safari Live team that's returning home this afternoon. Whoops, I forgot I, was, I had a roof. I nearly crushed that into the tree. That would have been most unfortunate, and that would have been another unfortunate way to end off our safari. I don't think Steph would have been terribly impressed with me if I'd taken the roof off. Yeah, I'm not quite sure what I'm doing. I'm bumbling. Looking for early nocturnal creatures. I've seen a serval here once. Hope there's always the chance of seeing them again. They do move about in similar areas. Hoping for perhaps a surprise leopard, something to cheer us up at the end of the sunset safari. I was not a chameleon. I feel as though I've already had my chameleon luck for the, e for the afternoon. Couldn't believe it when I saw the size of that chameleon walking across the road. It was absolutely enormous. Alrighty, let us see what we can find. Come on, Karula. Now would be a good time to pop out and cheer us all up. I was saying, you want to know if there are measures being taken for wild dog conservation because of course one of the huge reasons why it is so devastating to see the death of a wild dog is because they're so endangered. There are huge measures being taken. Um, they're being studied, there are groups being reintroduced into different areas where they, it's hoped that they will flourish. They're given the vaccines that they need, they're, given, they're sent off to different reserves to spread the population, to keep the genetics fresh. They are being constantly, constantly studied, monitored, checked for any sign of any kind of ailment or disease so absolutely there are enormous measures and the most important thing that all of you can do as our viewers of Safari Live and why Safari Live I think is so important in terms of its conservation potential is by raising awareness about the plight of wild dogs and by educating people because of course they still have this reputation as being pests or, or, or these basically just feral dogs or anything like that where in fact they're an amazing and unique species that it would be an absolute tragedy if we were ever to lose so that's the joy of these live safaris and that's what all of you can do and teach your kids about how valuable each and every single species is to the world around us so yes lots of measures being taken and I hope that in our way doing these live safaris, I do hope that we're contributing to, well, oh, it was an ill-timed, ill-timed bump in the middle of a profound speech. Um, I hope that in some way our live safaris are contributing as much as possible in the way that we can to the preservation, not preservation, wrong word, conservation, not just the wild dogs, anything that we see out here. I hope that is the case. And I hope that over the next few generations we see wild dogs flourishing as a species. It might be a long and hard road, but lots of species have recovered before. There have been some positive stories in conservation over, the, over recent years, and I'm hoping that wild dogs will be one of them. There's some amazing studies being done by the Endangered Wildlife Trust, the EWT, into wild dogs. 
Now, I would definitely encourage you to have a look at some of the amazing research that the various people conduct. That, of course, is why there's a collared dog in that Investec pack, is to help to keep track and to monitor them. It's a difficult species, though. They're so fragile, and they need so, so much space. Alright, as a somewhat subdued Safari Live team heads home, it's time for us, Vim and myself, to say farewell. So we're going to say goodbye to you all. We hope that you, while well, perhaps not enjoyed your live safari, but we hope that you learned something from your live safari. And we will see you tomorrow morning for a hopefully much happier sunrise safari. Until we see you again, thank you very much. Thank you, Vim, and we'll see you then. Bye-bye, everybody. Well, we're coming to the end of a, I would probably say, the most eventful safari that I've ever experienced since I've been here with uh, Safari Live, Jandre. For you, sad. if the saddest, yeah, it was. It was truly, really, really sad um, to see that poor little puppy get caught by the line. But as I was saying a bit earlier, we we got to realise that this is a natural system, and. I really try uh, to not anthropomorphize and 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 put human qualities and and connotations onto 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 the animals, but it is incredibly difficult for us, and it's in our nature to do it, and uh, and it is <laughs> it's so hard. You should see Jean-Dre's face. It looks like someone hit him with a big stick. I mean, he looks miserable, uh, and I'm I'm I'm. We've got to take the positives out of this, that, that we, we got to witness uh, something natural that's been happening for hundreds of thousands of years. And uh, as sad as it was, it was special that we were there and, and we, we actually got to experience it. And I mean, isn't that one of the reasons we go on safari? Um, to, to, to have the ups and the downs, to see, see the life unfolding uh, in front of us. And, and it's all, it's pure, pure, raw nature. And it's always, it's, it's something to, to think about. And, and it's always great when you see the cute cubs, or tiny babies and all happy days jumping up and down. But it's a good reminder that, that, that living out in the wild, there's, there's a very hard edge to it. These animals have incredibly hard lives. Uh, it is a constant battle for survival. As, as today showed, it was, it, it, it's, it's constantly there. And, I was, and earlier I was saying that generally if 15 wild dog puppies are, are born, I mean, four will make it to adulthood. I mean, they've got a massive mortality rate. And uh, lions are one of the, the biggest killers of wild dog puppies. So it, it, hands down. Oh, but on a happier note, uh, remember uh, that it was the royal f the royal twins birthday yesterday and we do love a good Hosanna and Shongile and uh, just to remind you that there are still t-shirts and uh, and the, the high res, res image the high res image works a bit differently um, you can uh, give a contribution to send us to other far flung corners of Africa to see other incredible things and uh, you can uh, leave a contribution of your choice and also uh, then I'm just trying to remember the, the website now oh there's a lone impala so I'm going to keep talking but I just want to make sure there's no wild dog coming after that impala um, but it is royalbirthday.wildearth.tv uh, if you would like to purchase uh, one of those shirts or uh, lots of other paraphernalia or one of those images but from all of us here and the disappearing impala uh, good night and see you on a happier sunrise safari tomorrow